Welcome, Leonard. Thank you. Yeah, I'm very glad that you're here today. And we're going to be discussing um, inclusion and diversity, which I feel that inclusion and diversity is definitely a trending topic and on the agenda of most large multinational companies. Um, but sometimes it feels a little impersonal. And I'm glad that you're here today to find out from your side um, about your specific IND philosophy and how did it develop for you? Good. Well, um, hello. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. Indeed, a big topic, and uh, by no means I'm going to pretend that we know it all, far from it. Uh, but maybe let me start by, um, by just talking a bit of how it did develop over the years, uh, to your question. Um, the starting point for us, for us was we were running a very successful women's network, which is very popular, was very well attended. But after about five years, uh, we really wanted to assess what was working and what wasn't working. Um, so with the key question really was, did we move the needle? And we talk a lot about, did we move the needle and do we move the needle? But I think our key learning at that point was that diversity can't thrive without an inclusive culture. Uh, and similarly, you can say you aren't inclusive unless you have diversity. So what the change that we made, we really needed to make a real commitment to an inclusive culture. And that was across all levels, across functions and, and locations. So in simple terms, what we did, we put the I before the B. And that was a really important step. And then obviously when it comes to inclusion, there's enough proof in the world that more inclusive companies perform better or that more diverse teams uh, develop stronger results. But what we found pretty early on in the process that it was really important to define how it feels to work in our company on a day-to-day -day basis and thereby defining what we wanted from an inclusive culture and how that would manifest itself on a day-to-day -day basis indeed. So what we did, we brought a group together of about 100 people, and then we defined a simple mantra, which is all around be yourself, be valued, and belong. And the whole notion there is that everyone can be themselves to the level they're comfortable with, obviously, feel valued for what they bring, and have a strong sense of belonging with our brands, the company, and clearly our people. And importantly, and you made it in, you made, made that point earlier, it's not a strategy. Uh, there's a strategy you can agree and disagree with. For us, for us, it's really a philosophy. It's the way we do things. And therefore, no one can opt out. And I think that's a really important point. And ever since that we made that change and we defined that philosophy, we are working to bring this philosophy to life uh, and really in everything we do. And one of the things that I would mention, something that we found really powerful is that uh, is what we call an ambassador network. We have more than 100 people from right across the business, across countries, really to be the catalyst to embed that philosophy uh, around be yourself, be valued and belong and pushing us to do more and do it quicker and at more scale. So I would call it a real mo movement and they would call it making IND uh, main mainstream. Um, and I truly believe that's the only way to make progress is to make it, make it everyone's priority, embed it in a philosophy and then create this movement. But as I said at the very beginning, there's lots of good things that are happening. We acknowledge that there's way more to be done. Yeah, and how does that philosophy then connect with uh, Coca-Cola Euro-Pacific partner strategy? I think it's very much integrated in our strategy. Uh, and if you look at our strategy in simple terms, it's centered around three things, great people, great service, and great beverages. And as part of that great people element, uh, that great people part, we have explicitly called out uh, that we want to create a safe, open, inclusive, and diverse workplace. So you could argue that's only step one, right? To have it integrated in the strategy, but then you need to drive the accountability. Uh, and as an example, part of my annual objective is, the, um, is what initiatives I take to make CCP a more inclusive and more diverse place to work. And the same applies to my team uh, and the teams that I work with. And I think that drives accountability. So then you have it embedded in the strategy, you have the accountability, but then you need, still need to turn it into, into action. And, and perhaps I can give um, a few examples on how we try to turn it into action, uh, from accountability into action. Uh, the first thing I would say is we've established uh, what we call catalyst groups across the okay. company uh, to drive progress in five areas of diversity that we focus on. There's more, but these are the ones we focused on. And there are cultural heritage, uh, multi-generation, now we need to get all five, right? Disability, mm -hmm. gender, and LGBT+. And all of these catalyst groups have representation across all countries, all functions and levels, and importantly, also have an executive team sponsor. Uh, okay. I'm, the executive, I'm the executive sponsor on gender, and I'm working with that catalyst group to see how we can truly move the needle on gender balance and, and equality. So that's one way to just put it into, put it into action. The other thing is, uh, in our leadership meetings, we always have a people section. Uh, and most likely, we always start with the people section. And in this section, we really talk a lot about the progress that we make on IND. 
what's okay. working, what's not, what interventions we can make. Um, and as an example, only from this week, I had a conversation with one of the countries uh, on further steps that we can take uh, to get to more diverse hiring. So start with yeah. embedding it in the strategy, defining the accountability and get, get measured on it uh, and then turn it into action. And what do you do um, or how do you address individuals that you see when they're not aligned with the IND philosophy? Yeah. Yeah, I think the key thing for us is to, to communicate about the philosophy and the intention behind it. And, and I think when doing that, you need to acknowledge that not everyone starts from the same page. And that's okay. Right? Uh, and it's also important to establish that it's not a zero-sum game. Um, so when we talk about it and communicate about it, I also find it sometimes quite powerful to talk about the opposite of our philosophy. What if we would have an environment where people cannot be themselves, where they're not valued for what they do, and have no sense of belonging. And that really hits home because no really, no one really wants to uh, work in an environment like that. Um, and actually what we're seeing is a lot of buy into our philosophy. I think where we see the biggest opportunity is how we make that philosophy come to life. And what we typically hear from our people is two things. First and foremost, a challenge to go faster and, and bolder. Uh, and that's great because we, we like that, but also a request for what I would call tools and tips on how to make it part of the, of the day, daily working. Uh, and and, and a few things that we've, we've come across, and, and maybe you allow me to just share a few, few of the learnings that we had on, on really making it to life day to day. I think what we have learned, first and foremost, is make IND part of the conversation uh, and make it very practical. IND can be very conceptual, and we felt that if you make it very tangible, make it very practical, uh, then it starts to hit home. And for instance, uh, we ask ourselves three simple questions uh, frequently. Number one is, does my team feel more inclusive this week than maybe the week before? Uh, what was the last time that a team member felt excluded? And do we have a balanced and diverse candidate list for every vacancy in the team? And those are just simple three questions that you can ask every day of the week uh, and, and, and really have that conversation with the team. So we really expect that that conversation is being held in team meetings uh, and in, and in uh, management meetings as well. The second thing I would say is, is create an environment where people can say what's really on their mind. Uh, as I mentioned, not everyone is on the same page, uh, and, and we just want to make sure that at some point everyone will be on the same page, but that needs conversation, uh, and it also needs an, a kind of an environment where people feel they can say what's on their mind, good, uh, positive, or negative, and that, that, that's what we call the, uh, the little voice, uh, and the little voice means you can basically say anything what's on your mind, and, and really we ask people specifically, what does your little voice say? Uh, and I think it's important to just stimulate the conversation uh, and also to just challenge ourselves a bit more on maybe the things that have not been said so far. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is that the learning together uh, as a team is really important. Um, we, at some point, the leadership team in the UK, we did a 24-hour marathon uh, on IND, um, learning together on many aspects of inclusion. And it was very insightful and especially to do it together. Uh, and one of the things that I appreciate coming from that session uh, more at, uh, at an individual level, is that we also um, apply now reverse mentoring uh, to gain more insights from across the business. At least it helps me a lot. So maybe just some thoughts on how we really say, okay, we acknowledge that not everyone's on the same page. It's a philosophy. So we want people to opt in and not opt out, uh, but that's clearly a kind of a, an environment that we need to create uh, for people to uh, just come on board. And how are you guys measuring that? Is it through surveys, through the organization, or how do you go about looking at, let's say, the improvement as, as you go? Yeah, I think it's really important that you measure. Uh, and measuring progress is crucial. Uh, there's various ways to do it. Uh, I have to say, though, that for us, uh, the, our starting point is a real belief that effectively embedding our IND philosophy around this, be yourself, uh, be, uh, be valued and belong, will indeed lead to more engagement uh, and a better place to work. And ultimately, that's what will drive the business results. So I think it's important from, to start from that belief. But then to your point, you can measure it in various ways. And some are more qualitative, some are more quantitative. I would call out two things. Um, one is around our engagement survey, uh, which we do on a regular basis. We tend to call it the pill survey because it's really a pulse of how people feel in the organization. And we really use that as a springboard or a platform to just say what's working and what's not but also to see what we can learn from other parts of the world or what we can learn from other teams and other functions uh, and all kinds of the variances the, that we see within. So, and that, that's important because overall, you wouldn't want to create an environment where people uh, are more engaged. But to make it more specifically on, the, and on kind of inclusion and diversity, we also um, do a survey around IND 
uh, there's actually one going out uh, not too far from uh, from now but to just try specifically on ID, get the insights on what people feel is working, what's not working, where we're we making the progress, where we're we not making the progress at all. And if I go on the base of the engagement uh, pulse surveys that we do, we get a lot of qualitative comments. So it really gives you an in-depth insight into what works and what doesn't work. And again, we use that as a platform uh, to um, uh, kind of to make it uh, make it better. That's on the kind of surveys you can do. And then there's also the more specific targets that we have. We have, for instance, targets on gender balance. And, and then we measure that. And on a quarterly basis, we sit together and say, okay, this was the target that we've set for the year. Uh, how are we tracking against that? And, and what are maybe some of the barriers or maybe what are some of the things that we need to do better in order for us to uh, to, to get to that target? So I think it's crucially important uh, to, to measure the progress, uh, but it starts from a belief that indeed a, a philosophy on IND will lead to a more engaged uh, kind of colleagues uh, that, that really uh, enjoy working in our, in our workplace and that we will believe that will drive the results. Well, thanks for, for sharing that. And um, I, you know, all the companies, each company is at a different level, let's say in their journey and some of them may just be beginning. Um, so all of this can feel very overwhelming when you compare your beginning stages with a company such as yours, who has been working on this for, for many years. So I wanted to ask you, where would you suggest to start and maybe let's say the top two or three things that someone could do, let's say, that, that has been put in the position to really kick off the IND strategy for their organization? Yeah, I think one of the most powerful things that we did, I think at the very beginning, is that if you talk about inclusion, and I mentioned Andy, what's the opposite of inclusion, uh, the opposite is really exclusion. Um, so we did a video that was actually inspired by another company. We did a video where we asked colleagues to share what was the last time they felt excluded in the company. Um, and lots and lots of people participated. And I still remember the day that we played that video. Uh, it was very, it, it hit home in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. And that was a really good starting uh, starting point uh, to really drive the urgency of the things that we can do better uh, and the progress that uh, that we want to make. So I think then then you have to create that kind of that that almost like a collective uh, motivation uh, to make yeah. to make progress. Uh, and once you have that, you need to make it. You need to keep it very simple. As I mentioned, for us, it really makes a difference that we turn it into philosophy mm -hmm. that is pretty simple to grasp uh, and actually can be very actionable uh, if you if you make it part of your kind of day to day and uh, day to day working. I think what has helped us in, 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 in making the progress is also to hire someone externally who was there to challenge us and challenge yeah. us on the things that we were doing, things on the things that we were not doing, uh, or maybe the things that we were not talking about and really holding up a mirror and really challenging us on the kind of the progress that we were making. And I think sometimes you need that external catalyst as well. Um, sure. And I think another, another perspective, I think, from uh, external is many companies are dealing with this. No one company has all the truth. No, no one company knows it all. And we have really learned that actually connecting with other companies that are in a, on a similar journey uh, and really want to make the progress is very, very helpful because you will always find an idea that you haven't thought of that you might be able to implement. So we've actually find that kind of connecting with companies within our industry or outside of our industry can be very, very helpful uh, also in just inspiring new ideas uh, that, we can, uh, that we can embed. Sure. Well, Leonard, thank you so much for, for all of these insights and for sharing your philosophy today. You're more than welcome. Thank you.